Some time ago, I read somewhere that the animalistic origin of the human smile lay in a baring of one's teeth to keep enemies at bay. A snarl is all it is, more or less, and laughter, a mechanism of aggressive defense, is meant to disturb an intruder, like the bark of monkey or hyena when territorial boundaries are broken. So smiling has evolved. Why not? Sure, it can still be used to keep others away. I find the polite, closed-mouthed smile that appears under wide eyes and hyped salutation to be off-putting. It isn't hard to spot. People use it to make you feel like they're happy to see you, even when you can't imagine any reason why they should be happy about that. <laughs> it's usually rigid as a bad painting, sometimes jerky. Often it is accompanied by a kiss on the air in the vicinity of, but never touching your cheek. And laughter is still an occasional source of terror, albeit in generally in milder forms. Sometimes when I hear laughter around me, it makes me nervous. I look around to see what's so funny, hoping it isn't me. <laughs> I check my pants zipper. I look at my shoes to see if I'm trailing toilet paper stuck to a heel. But these gestures, smiling and laughing, have taken on other meanings as well, and we should be glad of that. How else could we tell when we're amusing one another? This evolutionary flip-flop has added to the radiance of the human face. My daughter, Kez, has always been full of smiles, even from an age when the pediatrician said that she could not be smiling real smiles at all, and what we were perceiving as smiles were really meaningless gestures, of gestures of motor muscles, uh, likely in response to gas. <laughs> the doctor was wrong, and I have no doubt about it. And what a smile my Kez could smile. Her whole body streamed with it, convulsing sweetly, as though the same joy that provokes her mouth to open and turn up at its ends is tingling through her like a current barely contained. The other day, I watched her sleeping and knelt beside her just as her eyes opened. She looked straight into me in that way little ones do before they've learned to run away with their eyes. And as soon as she did, she smiled just the way she does. And it was for me. And when it is for me, my whole life behind me seems to turn itself into a funnel that flows out into my daughter's cupped hands. A sort of inversion takes place. The day-to-day -day of living at the edge of one's nerves is sequestered somehow, and I'm granted moments to reside in the roots of mine. The first time I saw her look and smile at me that way, my heart swelled taxing the seams of an invisible membrane that had been accreting imperceptibly over the years and bursting its skin like a fat orange left on the branch too long. I ached from it. I loom so largely for my tiny girl. The presence of me brings immediate, encompassing delight. That's a nice thing. It is worth living and dying for. It is life and death. It provokes one's chest to expand and one's ribcage to open out like wings. It is the death of trivia, of mindless motion, of the daily accumulation of jittery gestures and fidgets that pass for life. It is resurrection without the weight of the sound of that word. It is light and easy, delicious and tender to be smiled at like that, to be welcomed like that to be seen and, in being simply seen, to have one's existence joyously received like that. Does this sound sentimental? When Kez smiles her smile for me, I notice the moment. I notice the moment. And that is such a good thing.